Okay, so before returning to the, the, the issues of wheels, uh, as I meander my way or our way through these various topics, uh, sometimes I try to cut corners. You can, see, you can see this if you take a look at my, the slides, some of which I don't ever put up. And occasionally I regret leaving something behind that I want to, 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 to bring back. And I've got sort of two of them to, to, to bring back, because they're, they're useful issues that you can find. That, OK, they're in the book. But uh, you, it's worth my talking about them briefly. The first one would really have come up during seesaws, the story of seesaws. And if you recall, I threw something in the air. I think it was a, a, a meter stick, a ruler at that time. And I said that you could sort of separate the motion, I'm a little less dangerous, an eraser. I can, I can throw this thing. And it's simultaneously doing sort of two things. It, it is traveling in the arc of a falling object. If you follow a point on this object known as its center of, of mass. So if you follow its center of mass, that's traveling in an arc, the arc of a falling object. At the same time, it's rotating about that center of mass. Uh, so it's doing rotational motion. And in fact, it's coasting, which is the issue I want to bring up. It's coasting rotationally while it is falling translationally. I threw it, I threw it a little bit of an angle so that it, it does this lovely arc business. But at least at this point, the, what, what you should notice is it's translating arc, the arc of a falling object while it's coasting, the rotation of an object that's free of torques. And it, and it is not wobbling and can't change shape. OK? so so. With that background, I'll come to the issue of, so why is it free of torques? And this is related to, why is it balanced, in effect? And here's the story. This object, like any object, has a center of mass, which is the point about which all the mass, that is resistance of acceleration, is sort of evenly distributed. I'm, I'm, I'm sweeping details under the rug, but it's but it's basically the, the sort of the, the natural pivot of an object. And you can, you, for, for simple objects like uh, a baseball or basketball, the, the, this natural pivot is right dead center. For co more complicated ones like a horseshoe, it's, it's sort of in the center. It's actually in a place where if the horseshoe is like this, the center of mass is sort of in here. You can touch it. Can't do that with a baseball. So OK, natural pivot. How would you find a natural pivot? You can just take the object and sort of spin it and, and see what, what spot stays put. You know, that's, it's, it's in the middle, so on. That same object has another interesting center. It's not the center of mass. It's got a different name and a different concept. It's the center of gravity. Center of gravity is the effective location of the object's weight. So this you know, uh, eraser has this little part over here has some weight, that part has some weight, that part has some weight. So, oh, can you make a simplification and say all the weight is located at one spot effectively? And the answer is yes. It's, I mean, you can't always use that idea, but, but it's useful sometimes. And it's called the center of gravity. So you've got a center of mass, which is the natural pivot. And you have a center of gravity, which is the effective location of the object's weight. Is there any relationship between these two centers? And the answer is yes. First off, here at the surface of the Earth, where, uni where gravity is pretty much uniform, they coincide in space. They're, the same, they're the, at the same location. They're conceptually different, but they're at the same place in space. Be and where does, why is that? It's because, remember, mass and weight go together here near the surface of the Earth. Every kilogram of mass uh, develops 9.8 newtons of weight. And the result is each part of this racer develops a little, you know, it's, it's got a little bit of mass here, and that mass develops its, its local portion of weight. This part of mass develops its portion of weight. And when you, when you figure it all out, eh, you get a center of gravity that's at the same place as the center of mass. And that's true for all practical purposes. That there, When you get into objects that are so huge that gravity changes is different from one place in the object to the other, like the moon. The moon is experiencing Earth's gravity. And the, the Earth's gravity on the near side of the moon is a little stronger than Earth's gravity on the far side of the moon. And that gums up this perfect match between center of mass and center of gravity. But the point of, OK, so where's the, what's the point of this then? Two centers, different concepts. One is gravity-related, center of gravity. 
One is mass related. It has all to do with accelerations and stuff. That's, you know, that's the center of mass. They happen to be the same place, but they're different concepts. And it, it comes up that people use them interchangeably as though they are interchangeable. And I guess maybe it's only with physicists that it, that, that it drives me nuts. And I've worked in lots of contexts in which the people are casually talking about the center of gravity and the center of mass and flitting back and forth, like using the wrong one for the, OK. So it, it, it irritates me, but it's not a huge deal. It's just life in the real world. The point then, finally, where I'm going to is the reason that the eraser experiences no torques due to gravity, when I throw it up here, it turns, it's rotating basically as an as a inertial object subject to no torque because of gravity. Why is it not subject to any torque about, uh, due to gravity? Well, it's because the pivot about which we care is its natural pivot, the center of mass. Gravity acts at its center of gravity. So gravity is pulling down on this guy when it's flying at its center of gravity. That's the effective location of its pull, of gravity's pull, which happens to coincide with the pivot we're thinking about. And if you remember, when you try to exert a torque by pushing on the pivot, like try, trying to open a door by pushing on the hinges, you get no action, no joy. It, it, you, you cause no torque. So similarly, Gravity pulls right at the center of gravity, which coincides with the natural pivot, i.e., the center of mass, and exerts no torque. And so that's why you can throw things and have gravity have no effect on them about their own pivots. It pulls right at the pivot, no effect. Is that OK? This has implications. You know, it has implications for one of the problem set problems, among others. But, but like, so, so I don't even, you know. The issue is to learn the material, not to, 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 to challenge you with questions, you, you not give away the questions. In the Olympics, and I did some pieces for the Washington Post on this, the, the idea of di uh, divers, for example, jumping off of a platform. Um, when they're in the air and neglecting the air itself, which can actually affect their motion, so neglecting the air, which is a perp perfectly reasonable thing to neglect, they're experiencing no torques. Why? Because the only thing acting on them at all is gravity. They're, so not they're not touching anything. So nothing can exert a torque on them. Consequently, they've got, they're not exactly following Newton's first law of motion because they can change shape. But apart from that, they really have very limited rotational possibilities. And I've got I to flesh out more material before I can say what those possibilities are. But the, the main thing is that a person who jumps off the diving board absolutely not rotating cannot start rotating. So a diver can't, can't jump straight off like this and then suddenly begin to do somersaults and then suddenly stop doing somersaults completely. It's impossible it, because there's nothing to twist you. And therefore, you can't start, start rotating. You can't undergo angular acceleration the ordinary way, and you can't undo it the ordinary way. All right? Any questions about? Center of gravity, center of mass. If it, if it ever comes up and you have to name the right one, think, think in terms of the, the issue. Is the issue one of, of angular acceleration stuff? Like when you hit a, when you hit a ball with any sort of sports in, in, uh, item, hockey sticks, golf clubs, all that stuff, and things, things undergo twists. And there are twists about something, a natural pivot. That's a center of mass issue. Right? So, so most of the stuff, that, if, if, if you can get rid of gravity and the, and the issue still is still there, then it's probably a center mass issue. On the other hand, if, if, there's a, uh, if weight is part of the story, things are being pulled on or twisted by weight, it's probably a center of gravity issue because gravity is the central focus of the story. All right, I'll stop the harangue. Second thing I wanted to, to, to resurrect or not, you know, not, not leave completely behind us is this observation that when I take the, the, the little uh, disabled wagon here and I, I'm going to get it going to the right and then watch it come to a stop. It came to a stop because the table exerted a leftward force on it. So the table pushed left on it while it moved to the right. 
the table did negative work on the wagon. Is that okay with everybody? It follows the rules. Forces to the left, movement is to the right, negative work. At the same time, the wagon pushed to the right by way of friction on the table, but the table didn't move. No work. So this leads to a seemingly an apparent failure in the conservation of energy. The wagon did work. Uh, the table did negative work on the wagon, but the wagon did no work on the table. Energy got sucked out of the wagon and vanished from the universe. Can you, can you see the problem? Or any questions about the problem? Well, the answer, the solution to this seemingly uh, terrible situation, terrible, I guess, only to physicists, is that the work is still there. It, it was done in microscopic portions on the table, little, little sort of minor micro mountains pushing upside down, projecting out of the bottom of the wagon, and microscopic mountains projecting up from the table. They were all hitting each other, and work was being done there. And it's, it ground the work up into little jiggling motions of all the atoms and molecules. So long and short of it is, no violation of conservation of energy. What happened was the energy got ground up from nice orderly energy in the, in the total motion of the wagon into this disordered mess of microscopic motions, uh, statistically distributed among the little particles that make up the wagon's bottom and the table's top. All right? And, and so, so showing you the failure, my, my, my reason to, 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 to rewind for a second is to show you the failure of, of work to convey energy from the overall motion of the, of the cart to some sort of overall motion, perhaps, or potential uh, energy in the table. Didn't happen, it ended up as thermal energy. All right? So about thermal energy, it consists of lots of little portions of conventional energy. Energy of motion, energy stored in forces, but just lots of little pieces. And what, what distinguishes it apart from that it's lots of little pieces is that it's very hard to get the energy in, a, in the thermal motion that's going on, the, ther the thermal action that's going on within a material. It's hard to get that energy to uh, coalesce back into something useful. So when you, when you rub your hands together and turn what started as pretty orderly energy in the form of your uh, calories you consumed previously, you're turning into work, and then it becoming thermal energy in your hands, you can't undo that process. It's, it's a one-way street. And the one-way aspect about it is the disordering effect of turning nice, lovely, ordered energy, the energy that, that's sort of a giant portion that's doing something, that's, or capable of doing something productive, grinding it into little pieces and sprinkling it about. You can't undo the sprinkling to get it all to come back together again and do something useful. It's very hard to work with it anymore. We will see later in the, in the, in the semester that it is possible to use this thermal energy to do, to do productive, uh, interesting things, but you can't use it by itself. The, the energy in one hot object, a fire, for example, you can't do useful work with that anymore for reasons that have to do not so much with you know, even physics, it's, it's about statistics. The laws of statistics are, are, are against you. But if you have a hot fire and a cold outdoor air, ooh, now you've got some action left, because you've got some order left. The order consists of having a hot spot and a cold spot. That is inherently orderly. How do you get rid of this? How, what's, more, what's less orderly than that? Let them get together. Let the heat flow across that divide and make everybody the same temperature. That ruins what little order you had left. But it, as long as you've got a hot spot and a cold spot, you can get some, some useful work out of this. And this is the basis for so many things. This is the basis for uh, all the thermal power generations, uh, you know, coal-fired, uh, gas-fired furnace uh, uh, power generation. Um, it's actually the basis for solar cells. You've got the hot sun, the cold space. Uh, it's, the winds are powered by this. The, the winds go from hot to cold or cold to hot, depending on the situation. And it's, so anyway, 
So thermal energy isn't completely useless, but it's, it's tough to use thermal energy. Uh, it's just like the disordering effect, my, my usual th story about this is, is it's easy to drop some beautiful Ming vase. <laughs> you know, ah! And if you pick it up again and drop it, you can drop it all day. It's not going to reassemble itself. It's statistically unlikely. Uh, that initial situation where the vase was all together perfect is, is, is so unique among all the possibilities of, us, of the, putting the, the parts that you'll never re-encounter it by accident. You'll keep finding new, more random, more statistically likely arrangements as you keep dropping the shards. To put it back together, you have to consume order from somewhere else. And you do, if you do it yourself with a container of glue and stuff like that, you are yourself eating order from elsewhere. And you know, so the last piece of this story is that all the concerns in modern life and society about energy, there's lots of energy around. There's always lots of energy around. It's, ne it's never in shortage. What there is a shortage of or, or concerns about is ordered energy, energy that's useful for doing work and, and all the work-related things. Physics work can, can do anything you want. And so it's the loss of that order. And uh, the shortage, yeah. So that's the story. Any questions at this point? I mean, not, not any specific thing to grab hold of, but. So to try to finish up the story then of wheels is that friction has, there, there are essentially two major forms of friction. There are others, but uh, the two major forms are static friction, the friction between two surfaces that have not yet begun to slide. And static friction does not make work disappear because there's no relative movement between the surfaces to involve work. So static friction is useful and, wa and wastes no energy. You use it whenever you pick something up by the sides. So if I pick up this eraser from the sides, I grab it, I lift. The forces I'm using to support it right now are frictional forces, the force, in fact, of static friction. All right. The other possibility is sliding friction, where the surfaces are sliding across one another. Now you get energy wasted. And the, the, the waste is the same story I just showed you, told, told you here. One surface does negative work on the other, and the, there's no reciprocation. It, it, the story can vary depending on who moves and what. But one way or the other, there's going to be energy, wa energy wasted. And the word waste, what I mean, it's, it's turned into thermal energy. It's not, it's not taken away from the universe. It can't. It's conserved. All right, um, sliding friction wastes energy. And so wheel, the, the purpose of wheels is not to get rid of friction altogether. If it got rid of friction altogether, you'd have no guidance. You couldn't steer your car. You're actually using friction to steer your car, but you're using static friction to do that. You want, the purpose of the wheels is not to just slide effortlessly over the surfaces. It's to roll on the surfaces. And when you roll something, if you, take, you just, okay, you do it with your hand, and. No, no one look, right? We'll just play silly stuff. When you roll your hand across the other, there is just touch and release. You're not sliding the surfaces. You're simply bringing them into contact and lifting them off. And that's what a wheel does. And so it's static friction. At any given moment, you can stop and try to, try to move relative, one hand versus the other, and there's, there's, there's traction. They grip each other. And that's what your car is doing. It's rolling its wheel. I can grab a wheel and show you this. It's that, that right down here, the wheel is touching and releasing, touching and releasing. And at any given moment, you can't slide it easily because of static friction. And that's what uh, propels your car and keeps your car from, uh, from rubbing on the ground. There are two kinds of wheels. One of them is, is, a, is what I would call a powered wheel, and another one I call a free wheel. A free wheel is one that has nothing in the vehicle turning it. It turns because of friction with the ground. And this wagon is, has four free wheels. When I pull the wagon to the left, friction from the ground, static friction, causes the wheels to begin rolling. And they roll in a particular direction in order not to slide. And you can play around with the wheel and watch the directions. And, get, and, and it's, in the, it's in the book and on, in the videos associated with the book. So I won't dwell on it. The alternative to free wheels are powered wheels, 
where the vehicle does deliberately turn the wheel and uses the wheel's tendency to not slide on the ground to propel the vehicle. So for example, this by itself is a free wheel. It's built as a free wheel. If I, move my, if I make the wheel move, it tends to, to start rolling because of friction from the ground acting on its bottom. But if I play games with it, I turn it into a powered wheel by grabbing it and twisting. If, I don't let, if it doesn't begin to roll when I twist it, it's going to skid. Right? Skid, 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 skid. So there's a lot of frictional force down here. Uh, the table doesn't like this and pushes on the wheel, and the wheel doesn't like it, it pushes on the table. And that, in your bicycle, for example, is what propels the bicycle forward when you, when you pedal it. You're, you're twisting the wheel, you're exerting a torque on the wheel by way of the, the crank and so on, and the chain. The wheel is trying to turn, but that would cause it to skid in its contact point with the ground. So there's, there's, there are forces there, frictional forces. And instead of skidding the wheel, unless you really, really stomp on the pedal, instead of skidding, the wheel begins to, to roll forward. And you're propelling yourself forward with the help of friction from the ground pushing forward on the bottom of the wheel. All right? A little bit abbreviated, but it should be, should be adequate. So the purpose of wheels, then, is to get rid of sliding friction you do want static friction uh, in many in, Static friction is useful with wheels. They allow you to steer the car, for example, and even pro to propel it. Sliding friction is undesirable in the whole context because it, it wastes energy. And you don't want that happening. OK? Any questions about wheels and friction and thermal energy? All right. Long weekend. Start, yeah, started on Thursday. I'm going to stop this, okay. And I will go over to bumper cars. All right, bumper cars. Hopefully you've all had some opportunity to, to play on bumper cars. They, they're still around. So many things disappear, but bumper cars are a perennial amusement park ride. And most of the action in bumper cars is bump, you know, bumping, just simply driving. If you want to just drive around, you go in a go-kart, um, which are, they may still be bumper cars. Um, the fun in bumper cars is hitting other people. And, and uh, yeah. OK, so I'll do my introductory questions with bumper cars, and that is seemingly unrelated, but it is. It is related. If you go to a playground merry-go-round, and these are an endangered species, but OK, hopefully you've had an opportunity to be on one somewhere. And you, it's spinning, and you're on the outside of that merry-go-round, and you pull yourself toward the center. And you do have to pull. If you've ever done this, it's not easy to get to the center of a, of a rapidly spinning, because you keep feeling flung outward, which is an, an inertia issue. So you climb to the center. How does it affect its rotation rate? You OK with the question? How many think that it will spin faster? How many think it'll spin slower? How many think it will spin the same rate? OK, so the dominant, the, uh, the dominant answer is, is the spin faster, which is the right answer. And, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a preview. Um, it doesn't look like a merry-go-round. I mean, it's, it's the world's stupidest merry-go-round. I'm, I'm just going to sit on it. This is you out here. Actually, there are two of you. And you are going to climb to the center. You see how it's the same story, I hope? So I'm going to get the merry-go-round spinning. Here it goes. It's spinning. And now you guys are going to climb to the center. All right? It's the skater trick. Blah. And I can only do that for a little while. All right. <laughs> Thanks. OK, so, so climbing the center causes it to spin faster. And this little piece is the reason why, if you remember that Newton's first law of rotational motion has those words in it that, that can't change shape. Rigid, a rigid, a rigid object that's, that's, uh, that's not wobbling spins at a steady rate around a fixed axis in space if, if you leave it alone. If you can change shape, the, the, that story changes. All right, so, that, so that's a piece of what we're going to deal with. Some observations about bumper cars in general. 
is the moving cars tend to stay moving, and we've seen that already in the form of inertia. But now we're actually going to find sort of the underlying reason why inertia. The inertia is the observation, in effect. The underlying physics, the deep principle that lives underneath inertia and makes it real, comes up today. Um, it takes time to change the motion of a car, one of these bumper cars. It doesn't, it, it, particularly if you hit the accelerator, you, you, it takes a little while to get from motionless up to speed. Uh, the impacts between the cars tend to alter both their velocities and angular velocities fairly quickly. And so something is, is happening abruptly during those impacts, and something sort of is exchanged between them. They often exchange, among other things, motion. So that one, one car hitting a second car, they tend to, the, the one that hits might well stop and send the second one off at high speed. And you do this is the same kind of thing you do in croquet, if you still play croquet anymore. You know, hitting balls and bop, knocking them over, or billiards. Same, these same things show up. Uh, the fullest cars, which is to say the ones with the most human content um, measured, uh, probably by mass, uh, are the hardest to redirect. So, so, so people, you know, you get two people, and the, you know, people pile in the car, they have a huge mass together, they get a pretty lousy ride. They do not get smacked around much. They, they, they are the biggest hammer in the box. And it's the little kids in their car all by themselves that, that, that end up swallowing their gum because they're redirected so suddenly. All right? So these are just various observations. All right, so my, my five questions, which we'll come to more or less. And the first one, then, is does a moving car carry a force? And that very question is one of, you know, sort of my, my favorite misconceptions. You don't carry force with wi you when you're moving. It's tempting to think that, 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 that if I'm moving slowly, I don't carry much force. But if I'm really hustling along, I'm carrying a lot of force. Oh, I'll, I'll really smack something. You don't carry force. Force is something you exert on other things. So you can't carry it with you. It is true that if you're really hustling, you can exert big forces, and even for a long period of time, on things you hit. But you don't carry the force. Uh, if there's ever a question about, is there a force present here or not, look for the other object, because forces are always exerted between objects. Between objects loosely defined in the sense that, that I'm one object, but my right hand and my left hand can exert forces on each other. You, you got to whittle it down till, to find what your objects are. But if, if it's just one hand, you know, it, it, there's no, not, no force to push on it. Like, it's not going to have a force. What it does carry with it, what, what, you can, or what you can carry with you, is not force. It's a conserved quantity known as momentum. And we've hit previously energy. Energy was the conserved quantity of doing. And as I told you, it has no direction. It's what's known as a scalar quantity. It's just an amount. And it's measured in joules, uh, but the, the metric convention. Momentum is a separate conserved quantity. They often go together in various ways, but it's a truly separate conserved quantity. It's the conserved quantity of moving, of going somewhere. It's, it's associated with translational motion, going from place to place. And it does have a direction. So that you can have momentum. Right now, I have momentum to the right. And that's completely different from momentum to the left. To, to go from one to the other, I had to make a huge exchange of momentum with things around me, uh, primarily the ground. <laughs> what else about it? It has no potential form. So unlike energy, which, which you can store in something that's not moving at all, momentum is absolutely about moving, going somewhere. You can't hide it, I mean, except by putting a sh curtain around it. But it's going to show up. At, you know, sooner or later, you'll, you'll, you'll escape the curtain. So momentum is all about movement. You see it. And uh, it, it turns out that, that an object's momentum is equal to the product of that object's mass that is its, its uh, resistance to accelerations, times its velocity. And we had no choice in this. this the, observing the universe and figuring out how the universe works, this conserved quantity naturally appears in the description of, of motion. 
and it has to be mass times velocity. So every other civilization in the, in the universe that has developed to the point of understanding physics well enough to get, to get momentum will have observed it's the same, mass times velocity. Okay? And it, being a conserved quantity has a very st strong implications. It means that if you've got momentum, you can't create or de destroy it. Therefore, whatever momentum you have, you're going to have unless you exchange it with something else. So I'm going to play momentum demonstrator here. I'm going to start. These guys are never quite good at going straight. Yeah, do not stand. Yes, sir. OK, I follow rules all the time. Right now, I have no momentum, zero momentum. And it doesn't have a direction, because zero is a special case. There's no direction associated with zero. And my mass, I have, of course. But my velocity is zero, so I have no momentum. In order to obtain momentum, I have to get it from something else. I can't create it. So I'm going to get it out of the wall. The wall is going to give me momentum. And direction matters. So it's going to give me momentum to the right. I, on the other hand, will give it an equal amount of momentum to the left. You're not going to see it in the wall, because the wall has got such a huge mass that it's going to be almost the velocity is so small. You won't see it. But you'll see it in me. Here we go. Ready? I'm going to get out of the wall. I've got it. I can't stop now because I'm carrying it with me. I'm carrying a certain amount of momentum to the right, and I have to keep going until I give it away to the wall the, over here. Is that OK? It's, I mean, it's more than just like fun and games illustration. This is real. I'm really getting momentum out of the wall. Um, it, yeah. Overall, I actually gave the wall leftward momentum over there, and I gave and carried rightward with me. I then gave my rightward momentum to the wall over here. And that's sort of full circle, because these walls are connected. We went from a certain distribution of momentum to a different one where I was moving to the, to the original distribution of momentum. All right, now I'm going to get leftward momentum out of the wall. Ready? Get set. And I'm carrying it with me. I can't stop until I give it to something. I'm not going to get to the wall. I'm going to have to give it to this step. All right? Off it went. So it's a real quantity. If I got a bunch of you up here, we could watch it be getting transferred from one thing to another. But I, you know, I've done that before, and it's fun. But OK, we'll, I'll cheat and just use my little air hockey table. So, so here, if I give momentum to so the, an air hockey table, right? you've probably seen these. It just has an air, air that rushes up through a lot of little holes and tries to get rid of frictions both static and sliding, so that once you get something moving, it tends to move at constant velocity, according to inertia, until it runs out of air. But what you're seeing is that I can give this thing momentum, and it carries it with it to, for, for the length of the air hockey table. right? So once you give it something momentum, it carries. And this is where inertia comes from. The idea of inertia, that an object at rest stays at rest, an object can move in motion, continues in motion at a constant velocity. That's because an object that's inertial has a fixed momentum. And it can't give it to anybody. Furthermore, it's got a fixed mass. So if its momentum is stuck and its mass is stuck, its velocity has to be stuck. So things travel at constant velocity when you leave them alone because their momentum is conserved and it's stuck in them. Yeah. The question is, is when I was pushing on the wall, I was doing work, work on the wall. Was there any relationship between the velocity, and the, between the work and the momentum? And actually, they often go together, but I, I did not do any work on the wall. So this is a good question for the following reason. Watch. <sighs> that I can't do any work on the wall because it doesn't move, right? But I can give it momentum. And we'll, I'll, I'll, I should say, actually, let me, let me sh tell you how you, how you uh, exchange momentum so I can do, do the illustration properly. You've seen how you, how you exchange uh, energy. You do work, right? We've talked about that for a couple days. So to, do, to give energy to something, I have to push on it. And it, it has to move a distance in the direction of my push. That's the rule. How about for momentum? 
for momentum, you exchange it with something that's analogous to work, but it's not work. It's called impulse. And I'm never sure how to use do impulse, give an impulse. It's got the word impulse in it. So to, to do an impulse on something, you have to push it again. And so far, it sounds a lot like work. Ah, but it, there's no distance involved. It's time. The t you, you, you exert a force on it for time. And the force now has no in work. You, do, you, you, do, you exert a force for a distance. There are two directions involved. There's the direction of your force and the direction of the distance moved. And those two distances sort of collaborate and, and they get rid of the concept of distance. Uh, to, the, it's, a, it's only an issue, are they in the same direction or opposite or at cockeyed angles? There's no direction left when the calculation is done. Work has no direction. It involves two directions, but they kill each other off. Impulse involves one direction, force. Time has no direction. So the f direction isn't killed off. Impulse has a direction. That, the point is, work has no direction, but impulse does. You can do an impulse to the right. You give somebody a shove to the right, poof, you've done an impulse to the right. You give them a shove to the left, it's an impulse to the left. Direction matters. So, so that's how you exchange momentum. So now we can go back here. I cannot do work on the wall, but I can sure give it an impulse. All I have to do is push on it for a period of time. And there's always, you know, there's always time. Distance I can't control, but time I can, I know it's there. So the harder I push and the longer I push, the more leftward momentum I'm gonna give the wall. And it's gonna push back, right? Newton's third law, it's gonna push back equally hard on me for the same amount of time. It'll give me the same amount of rightward momentum as I give it leftward momentum. And here we go, I've got it. The wall gave me no energy. It couldn't, but it gave me momentum. My energy at, at present, I do have energy in my motion. It came from me. I, I converted my own internal energy, uh, uh, food energy, into kinetic energy. And then when I came over here, I converted my kinetic energy into thermal energy when I stopped myself. The momentum moved more, more straightforwardly. Is that OK? So impulses transfer momentum. Work transfers energy. And that gives rise to interesting phenomena in bumper cars. So I get the bump, this, this, we can play bumper cars here. These um, hard plastic discs, like bumper cars, are, are very bouncy. I mean, they're hard, so they're not, you don't think of them as bouncy. But you know, the, around the bumper cars uh, is this rubber bumper. And that's part of the fun, is, is that when they, when they hit and bounce off each other, they tend to, to retain all the energy in the motion. All, energy isn't wasted as thermal energy very much. So when the collision occurs between bouncy objects, I'm going to start with this guy at rest, approximately. And it's going to be, since it's at rest, it has no momentum, because momentum is related to velocity. So it's proportional velocity. And it's got no kinetic energy, because kinetic energy is also related to velocity. Uh, incidentally, kinetic energy is, is related to the square of velocity. That is the square of speed. And that has its own implications, which I, I, I'll, I'll take a second and talk about, even though I'm walking away from a topic. The energy in, mo in, in an object that's moving is proportional not to its speed, which is the amount of velocity, but to the speed squared. Why? Well, it's, again, if you, if you look at the underlying uh, mechanics and mathematics of mechanics, you'll discover that an object that's moving twice as fast doesn't just have twice the energy with it. It's got four times the energy with it in its motion. Um, a, a simple explanation of this is, suppose you want to throw a ball. You throw a ball to get it up to 50 miles an hour. You have to exert a force on it for a certain distance. Now you want to get it to 100 miles an hour, twice as fast. You have to push it up to the, you do the first part of that throw to get it to 50. And now it's moving. You're going to have to continue pushing it another portion of time 
to get it up to, to 100, but it's going to be moving very fast during that time. You're going to have to chase it a long distance, the second half of, its, of the throw. So to, to rewind, give it to you again. The first half of the throw, you get up to 50 miles an hour. That's easy because it doesn't move very far, and you don't do very much work on it as a result, force times distance. The second half of the throw, it's moving fast now on average. You have to push it farther during that second half of the throw, and it takes a lot more work to get it up to this 100 miles an hour. So bottom line is things that are traveling fast carry far more energy than you might think. And this is why high-speed accidents of various types or impacts are so des destructive. They carry a lot of energy with them. Uh, high-speed things. Low-speed things, not so much. So doubling the speed, you, double the, you quadruple the kinetic energy. Um, yeah, it shows up all over the place in, in, the, form, in, in the trouble that's caused by collisions. Is that okay? Yeah. The, kinetic, the energy that an object has in its motion, the kinetic energy, so that's just one part of its overall energy, is proportional to its speed squared. More, in more detail, it's one half the mass of the object times its speed squared. And that means that, that objects with more mass, of course, carry more kinetic energy. But objects that are moving faster carry especially more kinetic energy. Is that okay? Uh, things that are rotating, it's the, sa the same rule applies with rotation. You can have kinetic energy in an object that's not going anywhere, but is instead spinning. This has a lot of kinetic energy in its, ro in its rotational motion. And if you double its rotational, its angular velocity, you quadruple its rotational kinetic energy. Same thing happens. That's incidentally one of the reasons why bicycles, in bicycles, why don't you have solid tires? on bicycles, they never go flat, right? It's because every time you start and stop, so this is one reason, every time you start and stop, you have to invest all this kinetic energy in the, rota in the rotating wheel, and then you have to take it out when you stop. And the more mass there is in that wheel, particularly far from the pivot, the more, the, the, uh, the more rotational kinetic energy it has. And starting and stopping solid tires is just you, starting them. You need a lot of a lot of uh, energy. So same in your car. Your your car tires would last forever in principle if they were the, the tread were were this deep and the wheel was solid. Um, but it's it's impractical. Too much mass. Therefore, too much rotational mass. Therefore, way too much energy investment and, re, and, and extraction at the end when you stop. Other questions? Okay, so what I was trying to do here is the following observation, that, that when this guy was motionless at first, no kinetic energy, no momentum, I'm going to have the green one come and smack the red one. And when it does, it will give the red one momentum by virtue of an impulse. It will push on the red one for time. It will also do work on the red one, because the red one will begin to move during the push and it will give all of its kinetic energy. When, when the two of them have the same mass, the match is, is really lovely, and the green one pretty much comes to a stop, and the red one carries away all the green one's initial momentum and all the green one's initial kinetic energy. There's a, almost a perfect transfer from one to the other, and this is, in, in the game of pool or billiards, this is a central feature of the, that game, that, that, that you can take these, these balls that are essentially identical and cause one, one to come to a stop and the second one to continue on. It's a little bit complicated by the rotations of the balls, but not a lot. I mean, that's for the experts. For the, for the, the, the newbie-ish type like me, it's, it doesn't matter. So now if they're not the same mass, for example, if I have the green one and this little bitty red one, they're still wildly bouncy, but now the exchange of energy and momentum is imperfect. So this, the big green one, watch, watch what it does to the red one. It just sweeps it right off the, off the field and keeps going. The green one gave the red one a dose of energy by way of work and a dose of momentum by way of impulse, but it wasn't able to give away all its energy or all its momentum, and so it carried a fair amount of it with it. The green one continued on and basically swept the red one off the, off the field. And this is familiar in 
in car accidents. I mean, if I step on somebody by, uh, by bringing up a topic that's uncomfortable, I apologize in advance. It, sometimes it happens. I've done it before where I've talked about a topic that, in which one of the students' uh, parents had, had died. And I, I don't mean to do that, um, at least not, you know, or certainly not to make light of it. But in, in accidents between a, a massive vehicle like a bus and a little itty bitty vehicle, a vehicle like a like a Beetle or a Mini Cooper, the the exchange of momentum and energy is such that that the bus just keeps on going, or the truck, the little the little vehicle with much less mass, just gets swatted off the off the road. The, the alternative is when a little vehicle tries to hit a big vehicle, and oh, I got to do this right. You see, the little vehicle bounces backward. It has, again, it can't give the, the, the large vehicle all of its momentum and all of its energy. The details of the exchange are, are, are interesting, and I, but I'm not going to dwell on them all. But, but they're all explainable in terms of the, of the attempt at one vehicle to give all of the other vehicle, to give the other, the other vehicle all of its momentum and all of its energy. And it can't do that if they have different masses. It can come to some compromise, but it can't do the whole job. OK? So, that, so that's life for the translational motion effects. I'm not done yet, though. Hold on, because you, you actually, you actually want to hear the next little piece, because it's useful in the, in the problem set. This is the exchange of this conserved quantity known as anger, uh, known as momentum. I want to show you the, the other conserved quantity that shows up in these, in these impacts. I, this isn't what I want. That there's a, there is yet another conserved quantity of motion. It is the conserved quantity of rotational motion, of, of, of spinning. And it's called angular momentum. And it's relevant to the thing I showed you the, early on, where I was you know, climbing to the center of the, of the, of the, um, the merry-go-round. Angular momentum is another conserved quantity. If you're spinning, you have it. It's proportional to your rotational mass times your angular velocity. So it's very conceptually very similar to translational momentum, the momentum of going somewhere. Uh, if you've got it, you, you can't get rid of it unless you give it away to something else. So you can't get it unless you, unless you uh, get it from something. So, so let me get myself into sort of isolation. The re purpose of the swivel chair is to isolate me so that I'm free of torques, at least about my center of mass. Right now, I'm, I'm free of torques about my center of mass, and as a result, if I start with zero angular momentum, which I've got now, because I've got no angular velocity, not almost, I can't start rotating. I need a torque uh, for time, what is to collectively then an angular impulse to get me started, to give me the angular momentum I need to spin. So I'm going to get an angular impulse, which is the next slide, an angular impulse from the ground. I'm going to have the ground twist me for time and that will cause a transfer of angular momentum from the ground to me. So here we go. I'm going to get it. I now have angular momentum. And it has a direction, like all rotating quantities. It's my direction of angular momentum is up. According to the right-hand rule, my thumb's up. Right? That's completely different from this. This is angular momentum down. So where am I going to go? So, so far, you're all, all right with this? Let me get something to exchange angular momentum with. And this is one of the demonstrations where I really, if you've got a chance to stick around, I'll try to keep this brief. If you, you can't appreciate this properly unless you do it yourself, I'm, gonna, I'm pouring angular momentum into this wheel with the help of a motor. So it's spinning faster and faster. Right now, the angular momentum, because it's rotating this way, is away from you, and there's a lot of it. It's going in slowly as it needs to because it's an angular impulse. It takes time, the torque times time. And now it's packed full of angular momentum away from you. That'll do, OK? Static charge. I am going to do something a little tricky so you didn't see that. I, I, I've now made it so that the angular momentum is up, like this. So right now, between the two of us, we have angular momentum up. My portion is zero. The wheel's portion is up. Watch what happens when I turn the wheel over. 
Now the wheels portion is down and mine is up. Together we have the same moment, air momentum we had. Now we're back. And then this. I'm not touching the ground. I'm just exchanging angular momentum with this wheel. So angular momentum is conserved. The two of us have a combined angular momentum that can't change, but we can distribute it differently between us. And the reason I'm hesitating a little as I turn it over is it's hard. It's twisting me like crazy. And you can only f appreciate that when you do it yourself. It's all a little imperfect because of friction and stuff, but otherwise it's pretty, pretty good. Okay? So. Thanks. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And if you can, come play with this thing. It's, you won't. Yeah. <laughs>